I am Tom. This is, uh, this is a picture of me. It's really amazing to see you all here at Twitter. Thank you, um, thank you for coming. Um, so uh, I work on GraphQL uh, and client infrastructure uh, at Twitter. Um, I used to tech lead the TweetDeck team, and I had a like, particular focus on the, on the front end, um, but had been slowly making a transition further and further down the stack or up the stack, depending on which way you look at it, uh, from front end ops to kind of API services and now GraphQL. So um, in this talk, I'm going to walk you through how we started using GraphQL at Twitter and a bit about why, uh, all the way from a prototype to production. And we'll cover some of the specific challenges of uh, adopting GraphQL in a microservices company, um, how we shipped it from zero to somewhat at scale, although we've got a long way to go. And right now, we're at nothing um, compared to like Twitter scale. And also, I'll talk a bit about what the future of GraphQL looks like for us. Um, but as I said, I'm going to do a quick introduction to what GraphQL is. There are, going, there are plenty of other much better introductions to GraphQL that you can find. So um, please go out and search YouTube to find those. Because you, if, if, uh, if you're new, a newbie, I bet I'm not going to do a particularly good job. Um, interrupt me with questions if you really, really want to, if there's something that's really not obvious. Otherwise, stick something in the, the Hands Up app um, or wait to the end. I, I might well have a, have a slide um, prepared. So um, the <laughs> Don't ever use emojis in Google Slides. It just does not work. For these, these, these don't appear in the, in, the, in the preview. And then when they come up here, they like, look like that. Anyway, so um, a quick survey. Uh, hands up if you consider yourself a back end or a server engineer. OK, cool. What about a front end or client side um, engineer? And maybe full stack? I guess that's kind of like a section of both. OK, cool. So we've got a pretty good mix, actually. Um, and then I guess we sort of t touched on this. But hands up if you're using GraphQL in any way, like as a side project or a at work. Um, OK, cool. And what about at work in production? OK, cool. Um, and lastly, is anyone using GraphQL subscriptions in production? Cool, OK, nice. That was nicely like a smaller, smaller. Cool, OK, some people over there um, who happen to work at Twitter and or Facebook. Um, so, as I said, firstly, what is uh, GraphQL? I'll just go over it very, very quickly. So, the first bit to know about GraphQL is that it's a query language that allows clients to ask for exactly what they need. Secondly, it's a typed description of the available data using that query language, and that's called a schema. And thirdly, it's a service that fulfills or executes those client queries with data that's available from somewhere else. So, let's just walk quickly through a GraphQL query and some responses just to see it in a bit more detail. So here's an example query that you might find at Twitter. It wants the name of the user with the ID 12, which happens to be our CEO, Jack. Um, comparing the query to the response, which is on your right, you can see that they have exactly the same structure. And this is the first key benefit of GraphQL. The response matches the query, so clients get exactly what they ask for and nothing more. Of course, they might get slightly less. Uh, an error might occur or the data might not be available, but they certainly won't get more than they ask for. That means that GraphQL makes more optimal usage of the client's network connection by reducing the payload size, which speeds up the response time, and that saves users time and money. We can also see how fields can be passed arguments, like the ID argument that parameterizes the user here. So the user field is a bit like a function call in that way. Um, here's uh, another query that gets data about a user and some of their followers. And it's where we encounter the first instance of a relationship between objects in, in GraphQL. So GraphQL's type system is built around scalar types, strings, numbers, booleans, things like that, and then object types that are collections of other types. Um, so you can see how a field can also be a list of objects, each queried in the same way. So in this instance, followers is a list of other objects, and we're querying for their name. So let's look at the user type itself. Um, the user type has various fields, each with other associated types. Name is a string, followers count is a number, and both of those types are called scalar types. Um, the user can also contain fields that refer to other object types, uh, as we saw, like users. Um, so the followers field links one user to other users. And this is where GraphQL gets its name, because it expresses a simple and intuitive way to query a complex graph of data. Users have followers who have tweets, which contain images, and things like that. So here's a more full example um, GraphQL type definition using GraphQL schema uh, definition language. 
So you can see there's an object type that groups and names a bunch of fields, um, each with their own type. And fields can be annotated, and this is a really interesting part of GraphQL. Um, fields can be annotated with descriptions and deprecation notices. So we've annotated the user type to say this is a Twitter user, and we've marked the favorites field as deprecated because, as you're probably aware, Twitter kind of renamed favorites to likes. So we might want to reflect that in the GraphQL API and say, you should really be using the likes field, but if you have to, you can use the, the favorites field, but it's deprecated. So, and it's from these types, and I appreciate this is a bit small, but it's um, from these types that we're able to um, generate documentation so, uh, and also build uh, quite advanced developer tools. So this um, screenshot is a screenshot of a tool called Graphical, which is an interactive developer tool for queries and also browsing the schema in a way that's searchable and, and interactive. Um, I recommend just Googling that for a, for a demo if you haven't seen it before. Um, so every GraphQL API will have a schema, and it will allow clients to run queries. And the last piece of the puzzle is the execution layer that turns a query into data. So let's break down very, at a very, very high and sketchy level um, how that happens. By um, this Again, this is what happens when you make last-minute slides. I'm not going to talk about that. Um, anyway, the, the, <laughs> the diagram here is a very, very oversimplified view of a GraphQL architecture. So clients send queries to the GraphQL service, um, in our case, via an HTTP endpoint. doesn't actually have to be HTTP. Uh, the GraphQL service checks that query against the schema for validity, checks that the fields you're asking for actually exist, um, and then it executes by fetching data, any, fetching any data that the query requested. Then it composes those responses back together again and returns that response to the client. So that was an extremely quick overview of what GraphQL is. Um, some people who know it well will be, going, will be saying, no, I missed so much, and other people who've never seen it before will be going, oh, I didn't care any of that. So hopefully that got somewhere down the middle. Um, I'm now going to just dive straight into talking about GraphQL um, at Twitter. And I'm going to start by asking you, does anyone know what this object is? Hello, Andy. Andy, what is this? Well done. You're, you cheated, though, because you do work here. But that is a tweet. <laughs> you, could, you could figure it out after some time. It's got various bits that you might, might recognize. Um, you might be interested to learn, though, that of what you see on the screen, only these fields are actually used by any of our clients. Um, the grayed out bit is wasted data. It's legacy from a time when our, ID, our, ID, our IDs were less than the uh, maximum ID, uh, the maximum number that JavaScript can store. And so, you know, there's, le there's a lot of legacy there. But anyway, the, the, no, one, no one uses those. Um, but actually, if you look at a particular uh, Twitter client, like say TweetDeck, it only really uses this much because these are some of the features that we support and there are other features we don't support. And that's quite a lot of wastage. Um, the, the Twitter API suffers from a few interrelated problems that basically hurt end user performance and make the API an obstacle to product development. Um, and it's one of the reasons why we've been, been looking at adopting GraphQL at Twitter. So if, if you've been looking at GraphQL, if you've evaluated it for your use case, you'll know that this is exactly the kind of thing that GraphQL was built to solve. And it's, as I said, it's a big reason why we're looking at it. Um, there are other reasons why Twitter could benefit from GraphQL and why we're looking at it, and, but they tend to be more organizational than actually technical. Um, Twitter's famously a, a microservices company. That means there's a service for absolutely everything, uh, and often there are multiple new services for new, every new feature that we build. It, it's actually kind of hard to be sure exactly how many services there are in production. I would say it probably changes daily. Um, but I counted the number of deployment configuration files in our mono repo, so just like looking at the number of files that specify how to deploy a service. Um, and there are over 2,000, it's like 2,500. So um, more than you could ever hold in your head. But if you look closely at any particular feature, so pick a feature at random and look closely at how it's built, how, what its service architecture is, you see the same thing repeated over and over again. So there'll be an HTTP API service at the front that receives um, HTTP requests and exposes API endpoints to clients. That API service converts those HTTP requests into calls to various other services, and that uses a um, remote procedure called system called Thrift, uh, which is a technology that I think came from Facebook, but Twitter and Facebook have used it for a very long time. Um, and often these API services will actually only really call a single Thrift service, which will be owned by the same team um, as an entry point to that team's business logic. So when the API service has fetched the data it needs, or made the mutation it's going to make, like send a tweet, it will then hydrate that response using a, an internal library called BirdHerd, uh, which makes calls to other internal services for user data, graph data, tweet data, or anything else it might need, and then turns that into JSON and ships it back to the client. Um, in fact, often teams spin up API services just to do hydration, just to be able to take a response from their thrift service and turn that into something that the API uh, clients um, can consume. <laughs> 
So it'll do nothing other than call through to a Thrift business logic service and then hydrate the response. Now, every single one of these API services needs a run book, needs monitoring, and needs alerting, and needs a production readiness review, um, which is basically pure overhead when all the services do is hydrate. If all, if all you're spinning up your service um, for is to do the hydration, then uh, your, all that stuff is just overhead. Um, this, now, while that architecture actually has benefits uh, for, for agility on the back end and has got Twitter and a lot of other companies a long way, it can be a waste of engineering resources. And I think it risks kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You, you lose some benefits that you, that, um, that you would otherwise have. Um, so we see GraphQL as something that can address this problem too. In the future, we kind of want to get to a situation where engineers only have to build their business logic service and can easily plumb that data directly into GraphQL to make it available for clients. So for us, GraphQL is not just for clients and for, for our front end, it's also for server engineers. So, right, again, another emoji that should have been an emoji, but actually, quite, that's pretty retro. I like that. That's cool. Um, uh, so how did GraphQL come to exist at Twitter? Um, so, a quick caveat. Um, this is anecdotal. It's based on what happened, at, what was happening at one company um, in one case. Uh, so, I don't know how it works in other places and other companies, and I, I don't know how much will apply to your situation, but I, I hope it's interesting. I mean, this is just a bit of a story of, of the, how GraphQL has come to be. So, before the GraphQL project started, I was working on TweetDeck, and I've been doing that for about three years, um, and it was kind of time to do, to do something else. Um, the engineering part of my role on TweetDeck had increasingly mostly focused on operations and infrastructure, so things like build steps, deploy tooling, monitoring, alerting, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I, I kind of enjoy building tools that help other people uh, do their job. I'm, I, I, building stuff for users is great, but if I can like build something that helps other people do an amazing job for users, that I, I enjoy doing that. Um, so I was looking for something that would allow me to do that kind of thing, but at a much larger scale. You know. Feeling ambitious, why not all the client engineers at Twitter? So at the same time, TweetDeck was making a ridiculous number of network requests to App Start. Whenever you opened it up, it would make something, some ridiculous number, like 150 network requests in the first few seconds. Um, uh, and so I wanted to help fix that problem. And I, in a discussion with the engin engineering manager, in, in uh, one of our engineering managers in San Francisco, I floated the idea um, of an API that would effectively allow TweetDeck to make batch calls. So it could say, uh, here's a bunch of network requests, go make them for me, and then give me all that data back. Just kind of, here's a URL, hit it, and then um, send me the response. Now, we thought a simple uh, and bespoke batch API would work, but that we could go for something much more general purpose, and that we might be able to address some deeper and harder problems. We were both aware of GraphQL and kind of agreed that it fit the bill perfectly. We'd actually both sort of been thinking about this at the same time. And so we thought it would be a good place to start. So from there, it was basically, uh, uh, basically the case that I had to go and talk to everybody involved in this kind of space. So tech leads, product managers, server and client engineers, anyone you could think of who had some kind of skin um, in this API game. And the goal was to get completely immersed in the problem space as it was at Twitter, absorb everything, kind of understand it as deeply as I could, and then use that knowledge to choose small first steps that would, um, uh, that I could basically that I could take on my own in some kind of like prototyping capacity. So during that period of intense discussion and requirements, I then wrote a, a proposal that outlined a vision for the for the project and then some specific short term milestones, um, and that was at the beginning of October last year. So since then, the vision has changed slightly, and it's actually expanded quite a bit. Um, uh, but the core is the same, performance, documentation, developer productivity. Uh, the project was time boxed to one quarter, and the goal was to launch a GraphQL service that took production traffic from TweetDeck. So during that period, it went through numerous production ready, uh, readiness procedures that Twitter has in place. Um, the first and perhaps most obvious question when adding uh, GraphQL to an existing organization or an, in an existing setup is, where do we get our data? And for us, we only had one real option, which is a layer over our existing REST API. Although data is available through the thrift services that I talked about, only our REST API contains some specific logic, things like access controls and quality filtering, that we needed to be certain we didn't bypass when, when we launched GraphQL. Now, that's not an ideal state of affairs for us, and I'll come back to our plan for improving it a bit later on. 
Um, we were also uh, assigned a design shepherd who's a senior engineer who shipped large-scale software before at Twitter and knows the company very well. Uh, they provide invaluable advice and guidance on the design and the implementation and basically the delivery of, of a service. Um, and that was a really insightful process, putting the, the design past the shepherd. And uh, actually, this is something that you could take back to, to your own work. Um, I kind of recommend putting in place something like a shepherding program. If, if you have people who have been there a while and know your infrastructure very, very well, assigning them the role of a technical shepherd uh, to help out with designing new things that you're building really helps pr proliferation of knowledge and basically should lead to better quality software. Um, Twitter also has services go through a production readiness review, which I, I mentioned. Um, I don't have that much time to, to go into, well, actually, it turns out probably I do, but um, I don't really have time to go into here. Essentially, uh, the production readiness review ensures that a uh, service has a, um, a, a run book, a guide, which is a guide for incident response, a metrics dashboard, alerts, resiliency mechanisms, um, and sort of success and failure metrics. And the PRR also checks your new service has been through a security view and has been adequately tested and evaluated for capacity. It basically checks, like, are you ready to go to prod? Um, but it's pretty intense. Um, and if you'd like to know more about uh, production readiness reviews, I recommend this book by Susan Fowler. It's, it's great. Um, so with all that having got out the way just to get a prototype out the door, we launched um, to 50% of TweetDeck users on the 6th of December, which is about two months after the initial proposal document was sent out to people. And within six months of that date in December, we were serving about 50 million queries a day. So what are some of the challenges launching GraphQL from zero to scale? To start with, GraphQL failure works completely differently to a regular REST API. Most of the time, the way you monitor services is using a success rate metric, or the, the main metric you, you check is a success rate metric, which is defined as one minus any 500 um, response code over the total number of requests. So if you have 100 requests in, um, in a minute, and one of those is a 503, then you have a 99% success rate. In most services, any errors will cause a 503 or a 500. Taz. Um, however, GraphQL is capable of representing partial success and, um, and basically shouldn't blow up just because part of the request failed. So that makes success rate tracking difficult because GraphQL will nearly always succeed with a 200, even if it didn't manage to return any data at all. One of the pieces you want to get might 500, the other one was totally fine, and you should really return that as a, as a success to the client and let it deal with the fact that the data wasn't available. But you don't have a success rate dip. So instead, we track exceptions per query. So for every Graph, GraphQL query, we track, that, turns out GraphQL query is really hard to say, which you know they should have thought about that before they called it GraphQL. Anyway, um, GraphQL query, we track the number of exceptions generated for every query. Uh, so aggregated over a minute, we should see fewer than one or two exceptions per sev for several hundred queries. So that then becomes our success rate measure, and we can build dashboards and alerts that page people if the exceptions per query gets too high. It's kind of a proxy for, for the success rate. Another challenge of taking GraphQL to production is rate limiting. Um, if you have an API at any scale, rate limiting is really, really important um, to pr basically protect yourself. Again, with a regular HTTP service, you can rate limit at the gateway of your API without even bothering the underlying service. You can have a layer in between that just says, well, hang on, this, this is a bit hot, let's error. So you, you track a user or an IP, an application combination, whatever you kind of want to choose, there are many factors you can take into account. Um, and then automatically error if that, that combination of things gets a bit hot. So if um, a user is sending too many requests or one particular application or one particular IP address, you can kind of say back off. Um, and that's possible. That kind of rate limiting is only really possible because one request at the gateway, at the API gateway, max, maps to a single request to an underlying service. But GraphQL changes this. A single request at the gateway can map to many, many, many requests to underlying services. For example, a, a crazy query that says, get me the avatar images of the top 10 followers of each of my top 10 followers. That's quite a lot of requests to the graph media and user services, but it's actually only one request to GraphQL. So to handle this, we built rate limiting into the schema. We associate fields uh, with a rate limit profile that matches the original API endpoint, so that requests made by a particular user to GraphQL count against their overall rate limit. So if you've been hitting the user API and now you're getting users through GraphQL, it actually counts against the same rate limit, um, which keeps us nicely, nicely protected. We also use GraphQL-specific defenses to protect the API. So imagine this pathological query, followers of followers of followers of followers. We have two defenses for this, 
um, we can measure complexity and depth. So um, we measure query complexity by assigning a score, or possibly a co you could call it a cost, um, to each field. And then we work out the total cost of the query. So if fetching 10 follower IDs costs 10 query points, and fetching a single user's data costs 10 query points, then fetching your top 10 followers costs you 110. We, you could call that the complexity or the cost of the query, and you can measure that before the query is executed. You can analyze the query, um, you can assign a, a cost to it and, and ascertain whether that's over your threshold. So by choosing a maximum complexity, we can reject pathological queries that are very costly for our backend before they ever get to it. And we can also defend against malicious queries using a query depth measurement. So that's simply a query tree height measurement. Um, for example, we could choose that if you go more than 15 or 20 fields deep into the schema, your query is just flat out rejected. It's a very simple but, and kind of um, blunt tool, but I guess it works. Lastly, we don't allow arbitrary queries to be run in production. So all queries must have been submitted, validated, and stored in exchange for an ID before they can be used by a client in production. Um, we call these stored operations. They're also called persisted queries in, in the GraphQL community. This restriction means attackers can't probe our GraphQL API or run introspection queries against it to find out what data is available. Um, and this was built for the initial launch because I was fairly sure that as soon as a new Twitter API was public knowledge, we'd get people sniffing and to check to see if it had any vulnerabilities. So we had to do all this protection before we even got it out as a prototype because all it would take is one person looking to see, oh, GraphQL, right, attack that. So that's some of the detail about how we've got GraphQL into production. This one, I, I can't, I'm not even going to explain. <laughs> anyway, um, so what does the future of <laughs> GraphQL at Twitter look like? Well, I mentioned earlier that we don't want to be a layer over our REST API, uh, because one of the goals of GraphQL is to reduce the need for clients to build and own API services. So we don't want to be pinning these API services to stay in existence. To do that, we have to find ways to maintain the same data access guarantees and protections we have now, but, that are, um, but the thing, they're things that are currently implemented in the REST API, and we don't want that. We also want to make it easy for new data to be plumbed into GraphQL without anyone manually editing the schema so that teams can get their work done without coordinating their changes with other teams and potentially being blocked. So one way we're doing this is by integrating GraphQL with an existing Twitter technology called Strato. Strato is a kind of virtual database, and a virtual database, or it's also called a federated database, pulls together multiple data sources so they can be queried and mutated uniformly, which sounds quite a lot like GraphQL. It's actually a reasonably old concept from the 80s um, that we've been working on for quite some time. You can think of Strato a little bit like a SQL database where tables are backed by thrift services or another database. Um, so there's a catalog of... Um, where am I? There's a catalog of tables, there's a type system, uh, there are uniform interfaces for accessing data in the catalog, and there's a query language for composing that data back together again. Again, a lot like GraphQL. So a client um, on the left wants some data about a user, so we ask Strato where to find it. I think I have animations here because I am a pro. There we go. Um, then uh, Strato points us to the services that serve that data. Um, so in this case, there could be three downstream services that serve different bits of the, of the schema or the catalog. Um, and then finally, we make those requests ourselves from our client, but in a way that hides where exactly the data is coming from. Um, and it puts it behind a query language uh, that lets you express relationships between different things. And um, it looks a lot like Scala, actually, the query language. So I think of Strato as GraphQL for the back end, um, with many of the same benefits, but without the focus on client engineering. And obviously, this seems to fit really well with GraphQL. So our Strato team has also made it possible to, um, I love that one, that's really cool. Um, Strato team has made it possible to add data to the catalog with a simple config file change, and they've made deploys automatic. So that gives our engineers a huge amount of power and flexibility by removing the need for coordination between different teams. You just add a config file and your data becomes available. So right now we're working on Strato-powered GraphQL, which will allow data in, the, in our Strato catalog to appear in the GraphQL schema with a simple config change. I should say Strato is not open source, and it's very closely tied to Twitter, and it's not something we're planning on releasing. Um, but it's really interesting technology, and I, I um, was thinking maybe if other people are using virtual or federated databases uh, or have a microservices architecture, this is something you could look at. To be honest, you can think of GraphQL as a virtual or federated database. Um, so these things just gel really nicely, and this is some established tech we had at Twitter. We also have a working prototype of 
GraphQL subscriptions. Um, and I plan to put, it, put that into production pretty soon. Um, I'm not going to go too much into our, into our subscriptions uh, architecture. That's probably a whole other talk. Um, we're using subscriptions as a way to get real-time data into our clients in a way that gives the client control over hydration of all the event data. Um, so the first thing that to ship uh, with GraphQL subscriptions for us will be replacing or supporting TweetDeck's live search feature, where tweets that match a user search query are streamed into the client in real time. Um, as I said, building this at scale is worthy of its own talk. Um, so I won't go into, into it too much here. But we'll be streaming tens of thousands of tweets per second from multiple data centers. Uh, and as an ex-front-ender, that, that is a terrifying prospect. Um, but this has been a whole lot of fun to, to work on this. So if you uh, want to hear about that, then talk to Gerald, and we'll maybe organize another talk. Um, I'd like to finish uh, by talking a bit about why I think GraphQL is exciting. Um, in the big picture, I see GraphQL as an enabling technology. So that means it can drive radical change in the capabilities of a user or a culture. I think we all recognize this, if, you, if you've spent time with GraphQL, you all recognize this in the huge productivity leaps that various companies have reported, and hopefully that you're seeing in your own, in your own um, case. Enabling technologies also lead to rapid developments of subsequent derivative technologies, and often in diverse fields. So I think tools like Graphical and Apollo's Optics are great examples of this, but I think we'll see more in the future and in much more diverse fields. And I'd, um, I'd, I'd um, urge you to look for cases where GraphQL can be applied where it's not currently being used. You all understand what GraphQL can offer, so I'm sure you have uh, ideas about what kind of things we could do with it. And I think in this way, GraphQL expands on Stuart Kaufman's idea of the adjacent possible, meaning that GraphQL is so radically different to what we do now that it opens up whole new avenues of exploration that were previously closed to us. Um, the present we have of REST APIs, HTTP verbs, query params, um, and endpoints is one possible permutation of the ways our clients can fetch data. But there are others available, and we owe it to ourselves and, more importantly, our users uh, to explore those opportunities. Now, that's not to say that there aren't problems with GraphQL. It's not a perfect technology by any means. Um, and I think the GraphQL community um, has work to do on some real issues. I think caching, in particular, is, is going um, to be challenging. Um, and, and so, as with all technologies, uh, it's trade-offs all the way down. So that's been a quick journey through GraphQL uh, at Twitter, why we're working on it, um, some of the challenges, and I guess also an introduction to GraphQL. I, I hope you've learned something. Um, and of course, ask me some questions if you, if you have them. Um, I also have stickers. You can find some over there. But if they've run out, um, come find me. This logo is one of them, and also the ones on my laptop. Uh, and thank you very much. Follow me on Twitter. Yeah, does anyone have any, any questions? I don't think there are any on the app. Yes? Um, so I have a question specifically about, um, I forgot what they were called, like stored queries or pre-validated queries. Mm -hmm. So from what you describe, it seems that the clients don't actually just form their own GraphQL queries. Mm -hmm. But that to me sounds like it's missing out on one of the you know, core strengths of GraphQL, which is like to give clients the ability yeah, to sure. form those queries. Yeah. Like how did that Sure. So for the video, the question was about um, stored, oper stored operations or persisted queries. Does that mean that the clients don't get to form their own, um, their own queries? So uh, what happens is, and I'll go back to the slide, uh, which was this one. So what happens is um, clients write their queries in the normal GraphQL, qu GraphQL query language, another mouthful, and, um, and then they submit them to an internal API that you can't access from, from the internet. And what they get back in exchange is an, is an ID. So that can happen at build time, so when you're compiling your app or you know whatever, like like you could write a Webpack plugin that does it or something like that. And that exchange happens um, only once. The developer doesn't even have to notice it. And then when the app goes to prod, the query is exchanged or swapped out for the ID, and then we use the ID to make the query. So um, what that means is that the request is much smaller, and that the queries are never sent over the the wire. There's like a um, uh, an ID that just represents the query that was going to be made. Does that answer your question? Great. Anybody else? Um, the question was, do I see GraphQL making sense in an event sourcing system? Is that the question? So um, now, 
event sourcing, that's a domain-driven design term, right? Is that, is, that the, is that where it comes from? I'm not familiar with the phrase event sourcing, but I think it's like stream processing. Is that, that kind of true? Yeah, so um, depends, on the, uh, depends on the application. I don't know very much about stream processing, so I'd love to talk to you about it afterwards, or someone else, if they have thoughts, shout. The way we're building um, uh, GraphQL subscriptions is basically on top of a, of a stream processing system. So as long as you can expose an event to GraphQL within your system and you have your a GraphQL subscriptions infrastructure in place, um, so basically as long as you can teach GraphQL about your event, then you can um, allow clients to, to query it. So from that point of view, in terms of just giving clients access to data that's already flowing around your system, yeah, I think it makes, it makes perfect sense. Um, and um, probably the best talk about that, uh, or use cases of this, is, is probably one that, um, that was given by a couple of Facebook engineers whose name I'm completely blanking on. Uh, at, at, I think it was at a React conference, so I would have a look at, at that talk. They, they gave a really good example of how you could just hook GraphQL into an existing pub subsystem if you already have it, or an existing stream processing framework if you have it. Um, but as, as I said, stream processing is not my not my thing, so I'm probably way off the mark there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, I'm going to have to do that. What is it? Bit.ly slash hands. Hands. Cool. Hands. Uh huh. Up. One P. Cool. Okay. Uh, the hat is available on in Japan. Uh, how much more efficient did GraphQL turn out to be? So, um, one the first thing we did uh, in TweetDeck was we we replaced um, we replaced a query that basically said who am I? Uh, sorry, an, an API request that said who am I, and an API request that said what accounts can I get to? With a single Graph, GraphQL query, and the uh, the original so, so for like a, a standard use, so maybe you've got four or five accounts. The original request was something around three kilobytes of data, and we got that down to seven hundred bytes. Is that the right number? Yeah. Talk to Sol, who sat over there. And um, by the way, th there are three Twitter people there and an ex Twitter person. Don't talk to him, but the other lot all work at Twitter. Um, he now works at Facebook, so you could actually talk to him about GraphQL, and in particular about GraphQL subscriptions and pr uh, transports. Transports, right? Um, so uh, yeah, so we, that was a pretty good saving. Um, the other, the other. Um, so has anyone here used mo the new mobile um, Twitter mobile app, mobile.twitter.com? We call it Twitter Lite. Um, if you haven't, if you're into front end, it's like probably the best progressive web app in the world at the moment. Um, maybe Flip, Flipkart probably is pretty good too, but ours is. I was just killing it. Uh, that uses GraphQL, um, uh, but it, it uses it from the uh, from the server, which is kind of a weird use case. But because it's a um, well, because it's server rendered React app, we can actually move that to the client if we want to move it to the server. And if for that for that use case, we actually just replaced a network request one to one, um, and just saw that just checked that it didn't um, regress on the numbers. So we actually have more work to do in terms of the performance, like measuring performance and efficiency. A lot of the work we've done so far has been scaling and security and monitoring and all this organizational stuff. So um, more work to do there for for us, I think, on like specific numbers on how efficient it was. Um, yeah, so uh, this is really weird. This is like intense. This is intense. <laughs> it's like next question, next question. Um, so uh, caching. Um, imagine that an app has downloaded. Um, imagine that you're you're writing uh, like a, a basically any app. But let's imagine it's the Twitter app because I can think about that one the best. Um, and you've you fetched a, a timeline and you've downloaded a hundred tweets and like maybe you know eighty users. And then you fetch your home timeline again, and we, you fetch 50 more tweets and you fetch 40 users and like 35 of them you've already seen in the previous response. Um, that is a really efficient use of, inefficient use of the client's network. And, um, and in, a rest, in, a, in a properly restful world, you would get a list of IDs from the server and you'd be able to say, um, I know I've already got this ID, so I don't need to refetch it, but I'll just refetch all these IDs I haven't seen before. Now, in reality, most REST APIs will just give you the data anyway, because it turns out that giving all the data in one request is better for the client. But um, if you're doing it properly, then you can use the browser's caching. Um, you can make the best of the, the browser's caching 
in that case. Um, but GraphQL doesn't afford you that. Um, so uh, I think that some, and a, a place we can take GraphQL or a thing that needs, needs to improve is the ability for clients to basically say, I already received this much data. Um, don't, or th these, these specific IDs or these specific users, don't send me them again. Um, and there are, there are technologies that enable this. There's, there's um, a, a, a spec that I think was part of HTTP2 or is related to HTTP2 called the Cache Digest um, specification, which essentially allows a client to, to part, send, say to a server, this is a re representation of what I have already in my cache. And then, which essentially unpacks to a data structure on the server, and the server is allowed to say, "Do I need to send this to the client? Do I need to send this to the client?" Um, uh, and that kind of thing, I think, could be really interesting. If, if built into GraphQL or tacked on the side of GraphQL, you could basically say, "Here's a representation of all the IDs of all the objects I've already received um, uh, in a cache digest. Take, give that to the server, and then GraphQL, in a way that was well specified and would work for any particular ID, could say, "Okay, I don't need to send that," and then elide it from the response. So that's what I'm thinking about caching. Um, basically, whether we can radically re remove, um, radically improve the way um, we use the client's network and improve the cache semantics. Did that? Wh whose question was that? Did that like answer the question? Thank you. Cool. That was like, yeah, a bit of a ramble. <laughs> Um, we, oh yeah, I should have mentioned this. So we used the amazing Sangria um, uh, library, which is for Scala, which is just like phenomenal. Um, Oleg, who who maintains it, tends to beat the reference implementation for implementing newly specified features. He, I don't know how he does it. I, I pfft, like, I don't know how he does it. But he, he, it's a really, really good library. And if you're a Scala shop, Sangria is is awesome. Yes, cool. L before I. Wander away. Does anyone have anything else in the in the room they want to ask? Yeah. Um, so the question was, if teams can dynamically change the schema. Uh, how do you basically how do you prevent breaking changes and things like that? So um, one of the really cool things about um, the GraphQL schema is that you can compare schemas. So you can say, in this version of the schema, this field was a string, and in this this version, um, it's a boolean. Um, or in this one, it was an, an array of things, and in this one, and now it's just an object. And you can do that diff at build time. And you can say you can de detect breaking changes. So, for example, adding an, an extra type to a union is not a breaking change, or um, making a field go from n like non-nullable to no nullable to non-nullable is I think is okay. I've probably got that the wrong way around. Anyway, um, uh, that kind of thing is fine. You can detect it, but if you make a breaking change, you can detect it. And so we can just write build time tools that run tests and say was were there any breaking changes uh, across the, the diff of these two schemas? Okay, sorry, your your patch can't land. Like you can't make this change. So all of that is like that's an example of like an enable like a thing that GraphQL enables. You can't really do that with the REST API. I mean, like you basically have to say what fields are the clients using across all the versions of all the clients that we've ever shipped. Uh, are any of them you still using this field? Um, do that audit and then say, well, okay, now we can make a breaking change. And the time it takes to make that, do that audit, you know, whatever. The world's moved on. So, um, yeah, the, the, you can. I hope that answered the question. Um, basically, you can, you can do all kinds of interesting things with the fact that you've got a schema uh, before, you ever have to, um, before you ever have to go to production. It, it's basically a, benefit, a standard benefit of like type languages is that you can do a bunch of clever things at compile time or build time. Cool. I'm going to wrap it up there. Sound good? Oh, there's one more. Oh, hello. OK. Um, do I have a slide on the end of this? GraphQL.org, GraphQL.com are the two places to, to probably get going. Um, how did I get into it? Uh, that's an interesting question. I, uh, I guess it, I saw in it a, bunch, a, a potential solution to a bunch of problems that I'd noticed at Twitter. And so I thought, um, huh, I'll go check this out. And then it turned out to work really well uh, for our, or at least in principle, address a whole bunch of the same problems. So it, it worked out. Um, yeah, I think that's how I got into it. Cool. That last question. <laughs>